beautiful symposium on Afro pessimism that'll be coming out at some. We're live on Facebook now. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, are we live now? Okay, yeah, we're live. So we should just go ahead and get into it. Assalamu alaikum to all the believers who are watching this today and all of our listeners and everyone else greetings from Milestones Journal. Uh, today we have a very special um, conversation with uh, Frank Wilderson. And uh, before we begin, I would like to quickly say a few words. Um, at Milestones, the reason why today's conversation is really relevant and important is because we've been uh, we've emerged after uh, some of the uprisings that we saw in Ferguson, uh, after Trayvon got murdered, and then also internationally, the Syrian crisis, the Uyghur Muslims, and the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, and et cetera. So we were having a difficult time publishing things in the regular uh, uh, alternative media. So we had to create our own platform. And one of the, one of the main uh, focus that we have in milestones, which is ongoing, which is trying to have analysis that grapples with real antagonisms of history and thinking about how to heighten the contradictions in struggle and thinking about the structure of the world. So this is why the work of Frank Wilderson in particular within the field of Afro-pessimism has been very, very relevant for a lot of us who've been active in the last eight years or so. Um, in the recent uh, political struggle. And one of the main questions that we had, and this is also has been internationally true uh, for a lot of the uh, folks who are located in different parts of the Islamic world is to understand the American project uh, really well. And um, in much of Afro-pessimist work, there is a huge focus on the basis of the American project and how that becomes the basis of the world and how to think about the living and it's a uh, contradiction with the dead. And so in that light, it's really important that our viewers pay close attention to this conversation. And we would like to welcome uh, Frank Wilderson to, uh, to our round table conversation today. I also have uh, Hannibal Shakur, who uh, is a co-moderator with me today, who's been in struggle with me. And we've had conversations with Frank before. So welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And Hannibal, I think you, you should start off with some of some of your questions and we'll go back and forth. Yeah, so my first question is a little, it's gonna be a lighthearted one. Um, and it's uh, Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, who are you voting for? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, those were the last two people I voted for, for president and, and, and vice president. And that was back in 1984. Uh, I was walking into the voting booth, and I think Mondale was running against uh, uh, Reagan. And uh, I wasn't really a, a critical theorist at, at that time. No, I was not. But I was a creative writer, but I was also working as a stockbroker. So I had all these divided lives. And I walked into the voting booth, and, I, and I, as I was there, I just said, what the hell? I mean, what am I doing here as a revolutionary minded person, you know? And I, and this is just bullshit, you know. I'm not. I'm not down with the American project, and uh, which is not to say that 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 I that I would poo poo some some. Well, no, that there are no differences between Mondale and 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 Reagan. But it's a. I think Reagan would be a quick death, and Mondale is a slow death uh, for black people. So so what I did is I wrote in. Uh, at the bottom of the ballot. These were right uh, handwritten ballots at the time of punches. And I just wrote in Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse and, and walked out. And the only other time that I made the mistake of, of participating in electoral politics was uh, exactly 10 years later, uh, when as a permanent resident in South Africa, I voted for Nelson Mandela. And I wish I could take that vote back also. So. Mm. You know, actually, um... Tanzine, you mind if I uh, you should do it? You should ask, yeah. Yeah, because then my next question actually, it, you kind of went right into it already, um, which is, uh, what lessons can we draw from your experience with MK, the assassination of Chris Hani, um, and um, Nelson Mandela's role in ending apartheid? 
Yeah, well, the, you know, a lot of people in the States uh, I think or thought uh, that this the period that I was there, which was uh, 89 for six weeks and then 90 for six weeks. And then uh, in 91, I, I moved there and lived there from uh, the end of 91 through the end of 96. Uh, and they look at that period as um, a kind of awakening period in South Africa, a transition to a democracy because the summer of 89, and people who read my first book, Incognito, know this, but just for your viewers and listeners who don't, you know, that was a state of emergency. And what you had was um, the uh, national, um, the Nationalist Party was trying to clean house and they got rid of the upfront Afrikaners who split away from them and created the Conservative Party. And they tried to have apartheid with a kinder, gentler face on it. Um, it was a state of emergency, but what 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 ended up happening? I'm just gonna kind of cut to the chase. Uh, about two or three years later, um, the moderates inside of what many people thought of as a revolutionary party, the ANC, got together with the kind of new Afrikaners, the clerk and uh, a guy named Rolf Meyer, and they said, "Let's broker something where we get something and you get something." And so one of the things that that the clerk was able to uh, get from Mandela, you know, as a result of moving towards this release in February of 1990 out of uh, Robben Island prison was um, Island ban the ANC. It's no longer a terrorist organization, but you make sure that um, the people coming back to form it as a legitimate political party are not the insurgents uh, who are being trained in the Soviet bloc, uh, North Korea, uh, some are being trained in Libya, uh, Palestine, and in Cuba, and bring back the people who are uh, doing these exile offices in Toronto, New York, London, et cetera, et cetera. So what I saw when I was there was um, a, what people were celebrating a, a mass return of exiles, when in point of fact, it was an orchestrated return of exiles so that the, uh, um, the majority of the 15,000 people in MK were not coming in. The people aligned to Chris Hani were basically staying back. And the people aligned to Tabo and Becky and people like that were, were coming in and setting up a political infrastructure uh, in uh, 91, 92. So what you already had was a, a, a huge saw going on. Now, my friend Franco Barchese, uh, Italian communist uh, and Afro, not Afro pessimist at, at um, uh, Ohio will, will correct me on that and says, you know, it was never a reformist move. The ANC was always a reformist party. And so, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a real bitter pill to swallow, but, but he's absolutely right. And so Ma Mandela uh, can unilaterally suspend the armed struggle. Uh, he tells us that um, all units have to turn in uh, uh, hidden caches of arms to a kind of dump uh, to show the world we're moving towards peace. Um, and then when the negotiations start, I'm, I'm kind of, there's a lot of stuff happening between everything I'm saying, but I'm just kind of hitting high points so we don't talk about- Yeah, like off. feel free to feel free to cut to the things that you think are oh. most important. You know, you don't have to give us the whole history. People can do their own research. Right, okay. So the basic, the basic thing was that there's a huge group of people on the ground in South Africa during the apartheid at time. And then there's a bunch of people in exile. And mm -hmm. all these people have been living for like decades like that. The people on the ground, uh, I was there, were are making moves to reinvigorate the Southern part of Africa, not just South Africa, but we're writing papers to de-link the economic structure of South Africa from global political economy and, and relink it with the frontline states in a barter system that is not based on, on, on cash and the international monetary system. And the moderates come in and they throw that aside. Um, there are committees for the negotiation for the end of apartheid. They stack the, the relevant committees with the moderates so that, um, so that there will be no communism. And um, we allow the World Bank, sorry, the Central Bank of South Africa to stay in Africana hands. They refuse our demand to renege on the loans, um, and it's just it's over before it's over before it begins. I I also think finally there's prima facie evidence that uh, five people within the national executive of the ANC were complicit in the assassination of Chris Hani. 
precisely because, um, I mean, you knew at that time who in the national executive was down for revolution and who was not simply by the fact that who could sleep in their homes at night and who had to move around to different sleeping places. Okay? <laughs> and Mr. Mandela and Tabo and Becky could go to sleep every night and Chris Haney had to change sleeping places all the time. The night he was assassinated, I'll end with this, um, only five people knew. This is very poignant for me because it was April 10th, 1993, the, the night before my, my uh, 30 something birthday, I can't remember. But anyway, the point is only five people knew that night, Easter, the Easter Eve, that he was going to sleep at his house in Boxburg, that mm -hmm. he was going to send his five bodyguards home to have Easter night with their families. Okay. The bodyguards didn't know. But some of the five people who knew were Nelson Mandela, Tabo and Becky, Trevor. Mm -hmm who became a uh, finance minister, um, Ronnie Castros, who was on the high command of Umkonto Wasiswe and in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, he knew, okay, so, and then one other person I can't remember. So one, one of those people gave key logistical information to Gay Darby Lewis, who then gave that information to her husband, who then gave it to the Polish shooter who rocked up on the lawn because the bodyguards were dropping off at the crib and they said, we'll be here. And they said, and he said, no, go home. And they said, what? They, he said, go home. And 15 minutes later, the Polish dude rocked up to the, to the front lawn and shot him in the front yard. So what I'm trying to say, and there's also a suggestion that money came uh, from something like, um, from perhaps a CIA front, like the Heritage Foundation uh, um, and uh, a German, minister that's all at this point hearsay but we do know that there was a double agent uh in the security branch who was also had connections with the anc who was coming forward to tell how this could how these dots got together because this wasn't the first assassination attempt on chris Hani. it was the first one that was successful because he kept moving around like a jackrabbit mm -hmm. how did the information that only five people in the national executive of the anc about where he's going to sleep that night, get to the Conservative Party and the Polish shooter. And this dude was coming forward and um, he died mysteriously before he could give evidence. Um, wow. Wow. That's deep, man. That's deep. Just a lot to learn from that. Um, I have a question which is actually a bit more theoretical and um, completely different area. Uh, so, in, you know, a lot of the works uh, that influence Afro-pessimism and that are considered Afro-pessimism, um, they focus a lot on Negrophobia and, and um, how Negrophobia helps in the psychic regeneration of the world as such. Can you expand on this point a little bit for our listeners and viewers? Uh, one of the things that Fanon writes in... Uh, Chapter six of Black and White Maps, uh, The Negro and Psychopathology, is that uh, the Black Imago is a, a destination for aggressivity that can resolve all the conflicts of the world. And so, one of the things that he means by that is that, for example, in the uh, non Black nuclear family, there is a, there's a, there's a certain hydraulics mm -hmm. of, of of, of pressure, and that and this hydraulics is I don't want to cathedralize it or demonize it because repression in the psyche is a mode of opera, of operation. It's not it's it's not necessarily a good thing or or a bad thing. It it can become a bad thing uh, if it leads to the domination of certain species or types of being, mm -hmm. but. It's actually, um, I mean, if, if you, if the three of us were not operating through repression, then we could not have a conversation because that's what grammar is. Grammar forces us to use the, the, the predicate, the noun, the, the verb in the correct way so that you can understand what I'm saying. Now, that's the, the modality of, in psychoanalysis, what we call the pre-conscious or secondary processes of signification. Mm -hmm. But you also got going on in your mind, primary processes of signification in the unconscious, which have no allegiance to um, 
the logical relational logic of the preconscious. Okay, so in other words, and that shit comes up in your dreams. It comes mm -hmm. up in jokes. It comes up in slips of the tongue. Uh, it comes up in um, the fact that when people say, it, it is, it, it's sexual a lot because when people say, I am a heterosexual male, and then they're in the movie theater, become my students, and John Wayne's on a horse, you find yourself having, uh, you know, mm -hmm. jokes and for sex with John Wayne. I mean, it's like, the, the, the point of the matter is that the mind is operating through three engines which can never be calibrated. And the mm. engine of preconscious interest calibrates the mind to repress urges that are taboo so that there can be community. Now, when, but that is, but that, can, that produces a lot of psychic turmoil. And, and I won't get too deep into this, but the point is that aggressivity wells up in the consciousness. And mm. aggressivity fr from the, the hydraulics of repression needs a grounding wire. It needs an outlet. In, in so-called um, non-civilized societies, that there used to be rituals and effigies and mass. And so mm. it really didn't hurt other people because mm. the, the outlet for having to, for being pressured to form community mm -hmm. uh, could find its destination in um, uh, proxies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What Fanon argues is that uh, for, the, for the world, there are many different kinds of proxies, but there is always one, one being that is a proxy always already, and that mm -hmm. is the black being. So that um, the mm -hmm. psyche can always uh, find, and when I say, I'm using words of volition, because psyche finds, the psyche does this, it, it's so much more complicated because it doesn't actually work through volition because it's, part, it's through the unconscious, but the force of the unconscious is subtended. Like here's the unconscious vector, and then here's structural violence. And the mm -hmm. point is that everybody but black people, everybody but black people has some access to linking their psychic fantasies to structural violence. Mm -hmm. And so blackness as an imago becomes, is always already available for resolving the contradictions of large communities or small communities, the contradictions of the psyche, which wants to do something in the unconscious and is forbidden for doing it from doing it in the in the preconscious mind. Um, so in 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 for one of the points that he that he makes is that in in for example um, a nuclear family, uh, psychic energy. This I don't mean good boy praise. I mean that and whoopings. Mm -hmm. Psychic the, the 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 bastion of psychic energy in most nuclear families finds its it's it's point of destination in the male child. Mm -hmm. Most psychic energy does not go to the female child. So what happens is that even if the male child is getting beaten all the time, what the female child understands is that there's an in, there's a there's a largely unconscious psychic investment in the nuclear family in the development of the male child. So let's let's so let's like get it right back to your question and talk about a, a white family. But I would say this is for all families. Mm -hmm. I would say that. There's a privileging of masculinity in all families, but let's the, the, the white family because the black family can't do nothing about that. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> so 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 here's the white girl or woman being raised to know that she's going to take a subordinate place mm -hmm. and be raised in a psychic environment where the where the affect and energy is concerned with the development of the male, and the mm -hmm. woman has a certain place which is not the place of producing the hegemony of the family, okay? Mm -hmm. And so a certain amount of aggressivity is gonna come from that. And, and what Fanon says is that, that, that the sense of being oppressed, which should be directed at the patriarch, mm -hmm. be deflected to the imago of the black so mm -hmm. that the stability of the family can remain intact. Mm -hmm. we 
very, very clearly in the uh, Central Park uh, thing with Karen and the dog right. and the, the other day, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so Negrophobia is um, the sense that Blackness stimulates a phobic reaction. Blackness stimulates anxiety. And what makes it in, important to understand, and this is his, his, his argument with, with uh, Satra, is that Blackness does not stimulate anxiety based upon a conceptual threat. Mm. All other oppressed groups stimulate anxiety based upon a conceptual threat, the mm. threat of illegal immigration, the right. threat of, is, of, of an Islamic dominated world, mm -hmm. the threat of a Jewish world banking system, mm -hmm. the threat of a female centered environment. Those mm -hmm. are conceptual threats. There is no conceptual threat embodied in blackness. It is a completely corporeal. It's the threat of a body, which mm -hmm. makes it interesting because what it also says is that there is no way for the psyche, and, and now we're getting into the abyss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just saying the non-black psyche. If we read David Barrett, there's no way for any psyche to think blackness as a human sentient, as a human. Blackness is an object available for the relief of the pressure that happens in these communities where one, one type of person is being oppressed, but they can't turn it on their community themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Negrophilia is the same thing, which is to say that here is an object of absolute enjoyment. Right. The important thing to, to note is that what makes the phobic phelic um, relay of blackness different than the phobic phelic relay of any other group because other groups are related to in a phelic fashion you mm -hmm. know northern california and white people are all into native american shit you know like <laughs> <laughs> you know um, but the point is that it's conceptual mm -hmm. it's conceptual here it's 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 bodily and what that means is that there's no opportunity for there to be a formation of black people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Hamill, do you mind if I ask the next question? Uh, yeah, go for it. I was thinking, you know, that you, you might as well keep the flow going because it's kind of... Yeah, it's it's uh, really relevant um, to that, what, what Frank was explaining earlier. Um, some years ago, you wrote a piece which, in, which was titled, Why I Don't Vote. And... Um, in that piece, though, uh, you focused, you kind of began by talking about uh, the war in Afghanistan and the rape structure in that war. Yeah. And then you transitioned into uh, locating uh, the basis of the psychosexual structure uh, in slavery uh, for, the, for the world uh, itself. And, and you kind of showed uh, not necessarily a connection, but like that's the basis. So in, in for our viewers who are interested in calling into question the conditions of possibility of the war on terror, for example, uh, it would be very important and crucial to understand um, how you in that piece and in your other writings, you kind of explain this primary basis of that rape structure, that psychosexual structure of, um, related to the questions of slavery and blackness. So would you like to, is it possible for you to expand on that? Um, yes. Um, maybe point me, make it a little bit more pointed. I, I, it's actually, that, that, that essay is actually reproduced in the chapter in this, okay. in this book. Well, and there is a part where you talk about like, of course, the brutality that's happening. You, you use a scene in a, in a TV, Yes. And you talk about this white woman who is basically raping an Afghan uh, uh, victim in that scene. And you kind of use that image, but then you go to um, uh, something deeper about questions of slave breeding, for example, and yeah. how, how something as big as that is was necessary to create the conditions of possibility of the world as such. And 
and in that world, we see all these different wars. And so um, it, it is very relevant for anyone who's kind of serious about questions of struggle, questions of calling into question the war on terror, et cetera, to understand that primary basis. Um, yes. Okay. So, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read these three uh, paragraphs. Sure. Because they, they speak directly to what you're saying, and it's, it's actually from this. So Absolutely. I, I start by saying um, a recent history book, um, I say, I've explained how the U.S is an anti-black polity by using a synchronic analysis of domesticity, which is talking about Jared Sexton's uh, article in which on, on Eldridge Cleaver in, in which he makes uh, three points. He says, the white woman has a limited capacity to marshal state violence or state sanctioned paramilitary violence against black people of all genders and ages. The white woman can have black people of all genders and ages brutalized for transgressions real or imagined, and she can rape a black man as the CIA agent raped the Afghan boy, thereby reversing the polarity of a rape fantasy pervasive in the anti-Black world, regardless of his size and strength, his prowess and his pride, he is structurally vulnerable to her. So the, 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 so the first point is that, uh, uh, that the first point that I'm making, that I'm gonna peel away from it, is that the Afghan boy in this film mm -hmm. uh, and, and a Black uh, boy would be structurally vulnerable to this uh, white CIA agent. And, and for your viewers who don't know, it's a, it's a segment from Homeland in which um, uh, this young boy, young man, you know, he's a, I don't know if he's a boy or a man, if he's 17 or 18, I don't remember. And his uncle is a Taliban leader mm -hmm. and she pretends to love him and she pretends to be a journalist to get him out of the country. That's so all the lies that she's telling while she creates this love nest. Now, what I'm saying is that because she's in a CIA, he's in a CIA safe house, he's incarcerated mm -hmm. because um, she has a gun in the drawer next to him, he, her sex is weaponized because there's CIA agents in the streets watching the safe house and because there are 9,000 drones in the sky in this region, mm -hmm. um, that all of those violent technologies are inextricably bound with the sexual encounter. Mm -hmm. and. But then I say, um, Sexton is careful not to include the young Afghan man being raped by a white woman as I have, in, in which I will correct momentarily. Instead, he hones in on the specificity of the black male in relation to the woman who is white. And so basically, um, the point is that if you think about what's happening to the Afghan boy, it looks like what Sexton is talking about in his article at the level of, of structure, but it is really only the same thing at the level of experience. Because what has happened to that, Af I'm gonna call him a boy because I think he's under 18. Yeah, yeah. That makes it all the more horrific. Well, if, if I'm not mistaken, he was a university student. Oh, thank you, so he's a man. Okay, it's still a crime. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's structure is still a crime, but the thing is that that she has she has violated his rights to the possession of his of his sexuality and his and his bodily being because she has he 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 is not consented to the complete context of this sexual encounter. Mm -hmm. The point that Sexton makes, in which I then. I won't read all this. Come come back to, is that with, if a, if there was a black person male in in this, it would not be structured the same thing, because they didn't come to the sexual encounter with any rights to be abrogated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He did not. He did not have consent to give or withhold, mm -hmm. and that is the basic difference, even though the weaponized experience could be the same. Right. And, and so what I then go on to show is um, through uh, quoting a book uh, by um, Ned and Constance Sublet called The American Slave Coast, was that, you know, if we think of the Electoral College, we have to understand that there could be no Electoral College. So the, the basis of consent, electoral politics and democracy, your right to participate as a citizen in civil society. The rock bottom of that is not where the Afghan boy is. 
Mm -hmm. He's got that set up and the invasion of Iraq is violating that mm -hmm. at a macro level and the sexual encounter is violating that at a micro level and they're all inter interchanged. So they're, they're, vi they're violating a always already recognized form of humanity, albeit an always already degraded form of humanity. Mm -hmm. But to set that whole structure up, you have to have violence against sentient beings who are not, were never, and can never be recognized as the bearers of consent. And that's what happened in uh, uh, the period 1800 to, um, to, to like 18, 1830, where you get 389,000 Black people in the South mm -hmm. being like horses and cattle into 4 million black people. That kind of breeding then makes the word rape inapplicable. You can't say, I mean, it's so, it's so, so the violence against the Afghan boy was the most horrific form of neo-colonial imperialist violence. But the violence against black people actually has no narrative context. You can't actually write a sentence to qualify what this is because there's no moment in which they had something that was lost. Mm -hmm. Blackness comes on the world stage as social death, not as an entity that enters into social death. Mm -hmm. And when you get those 4 million people bred, you can't say, you can't say, 389,000 people were were raped in a factory. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it, it brings out, you know, because rape is an individualized kind of uh, right. oppression. And that what it means is that um, it's kind of like why South Carolina is so poor and why Virginia has so much money because uh, Jefferson recognized that South Carolina imported slaves with slave ships. So he made it illegal for that to happen. And then he turned Virginia into a slave breeding state. Mm. And they were able to internally sell slaves to the Southeast Georgia, Alabama, you know, and make buku money. And they had buku more people, people in their state who they could use as county, who they could count in the electoral process. That's how he becomes president. Mm. These bodies that he breeds count in the electoral vote, that's how Virginia gets money because these bodies that he breeds develop the GNP of Virginia and uh, poor, in quotation, poor little South Carolina who can't do their slave ship shit anymore, you know, is mm -hmm. out in the cold. Isn't, isn't Frank, isn't that the same thing that they do with, with the prison system now? I believe so, but say more. Well, you know, with, with um, and I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on this on this part of it, but you know, my understanding is that um, they, you know, they're using prisoners who, by the way, they don't even have a right to vote. Um, you're talking about convicted felons who don't; they've been denied the right to vote, but they use the head counts in prisons to bolster, um, you know, the the constituency numbers in these very racist, very um, white areas. Um, and those prisoners are actually coming from other areas that are primarily uh, black, brown, et cetera. And so those, uh, those areas end up being underdeveloped, underfunded, et cetera, et cetera. While uh, um, you know, simultaneously, the areas where the prisons are built end up getting all this more um, resources and uh, voting power, if you will, um, from having these these heads that they can count among their constituents, even though you know these people don't even have a right to vote. That's yeah. Wow, <laughs> I hear you. That's heavy. Yes. So, um, all right. So I'm gonna, I'm also going to switch it up. One of the things we're going to be doing, Frank. I hope this is okay. We're, we're going to kind of go back and forth between. You know, my questions are primarily focused on like organizing, um, whereas um, Tanzine has questions that are kind of primarily focused on like deeper understanding of, of the theory of Afro pessimism. Um, so the next question I want to ask you, um, uh, back in the early 2000s, um, 
and I can't remember exactly what year this was, but I believe you were a part of an effort to organize a conference on the BLA. Um, and so I wanted to ask if you could tell us a, a little bit about your experience with that, what obstacles came up and what was the ultimate result of that work? Um, I don't know if I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No problem. No problem. We can pass on that. <laughs> I, I would like to I would I would like to speak with you and Hanzine about that, you know, mm -hmm. off the air and and then kind of prepare in precisely because I think that there was a lot of intra black misunderstanding. Uh I I I I so let me just, I, I don't want to like, just like not answer your question. Let me, let me say this, there was a, there was a tension. And I'm, so I, I wanted to speak in broad euphemistic terms so that I don't say who shot Ned or anything like that, you know, because, um, because you know, people had issues with me and um, I would really want to, if this came up again, work with people um, to resolve that, um, but there's a question as to, from like legal team type people related to the BLA, mm. as whether or not a conference um, honoring BLA insurgents and uh, demanding their release would hurt or hinder, uh, or help or hurt, help or hinder parole mm. uh, processes. So Frank, if, if I could just say something, yeah. you know, I think people are largely just kind of totally uninformed on some of these things. So, you know, we don't have to get into, into too deep about any conflicts, but I think it's important for people to understand some of the different perspectives, or at least, you know, some of the, you know, some of the kind of things that came up, you know, I mean, hopefully without, it, you and, know, I don't want to get you in any hot water. With and you. yeah, just to add, the reason why it's kind of relevant is that in some of our work, we have to deal with like legal advocates type of groups. And uh, sometimes they don't understand their lane of work and they kind of start giving uh, uh, recommendations on political struggle and what should militants do, et cetera. So it actually disrupts and creates that intra problem within struggle constantly. So you don't have to name names or anything like that, but you know, this problem of uh, political action facing problems with like legal advocates and them having the say on matters and how to maybe orient ourselves differently about those things, you know? So it's an open question without harming anything or creating any tension. So I'm gonna answer the question, but I'm talking about me and my perspective and sure. not, yeah. Exactly. Um, I I bowed out and it, it kind of just fizzled out and went kaput precisely because at the end of the day, um, the politi po political prisoners themselves who were black uh, decided, and I can say this honestly because I have, a, I have a letter from one of the BLA people, decided honest, honestly, but very reluctantly to um, follow the lawyers. And at, the, and at that, and at that point, um, it's no longer, for me, it's no longer a discussion. You know, the committee has to do what, what the incarcerated individual um, wants, even though, and, and they were, some of them were torn because, between the politics of wanting this thing out there so that we could keep BLA on the table and, and in front of a new generation mm -hmm. and, and the advice of, of, of counsel and other people uh, about what, that would mean in parole, parole hearings. My own view back then, and um, it still remains uh, today, um, is different. I will also say that I would do the same thing again by bowing out if the political prisoner said that to me again. But my own view was that um, there's no way to teach the unconscious, the unconscious of the parole board, the unconscious of Congress, the unconscious of the president. There's no way, there's no way to teach anyone's unconscious because an unconscious is a faith-based initiative. So you can only teach the pre-conscious analytic mind, you know, and you cannot teach the unconscious to see 
a black prisoner as redeemable because you cannot teach the unconscious to see a black person as redeemable. And I, for my money, that was already proven uh, when um, uh, Baby Bush was sworn in in uh, January after, after Clinton uh, uh, final office um, and his term ended. And what Clinton did, we've been working with a group of, of, of that same, many of the people, you were on that committee, uh, Hannibal, and many of the same people on the committee, uh, but there are others who were who were uh, white, like ODS, weather undergrounders. And we before that, we had been, I've been working with them in, a, in to get all political prisoners pardoned by uh, Clinton when he left office. And Clinton, uh, Dave Dillinger for, from the Chicago 8 trial, uh, went to the Poconos and vacation with Hillary and, and uh, Bill Clinton prior, at the end of the term and said, hey, we got to deal with this because Republicans ain't going to be uh, releasing people. And Clinton mm -hmm. said, yeah, right on. And he said, uh, he, he pardoned the F, uh, SDS Weather Undergrounders, mm -hmm. like Linda Evans. Uh, and then he pardoned the, uh, F, uh, the Puerto Rican independence revolutionaries on the condition that they signed a little thing saying that they, re they renounced armed struggle. Um, and he was set to pardon Leonard Peltier. Um, and so now we're moving from like October to January mm -hmm. and he's not looking at the Panthers and the BLA. He's not considering them. We've gone into the prisons and, and put a uh, lip rouge and makeup on the women and coif their hair and taken photographs and videos and put brochures together saying, you know, back in 68, I was a good girl from Iowa. And I just fell in with some of the wrong people and mm -hmm. happened to bomb Bank of America. <laughs> You know, but now I've learned my lesson and I'm ready to come out and be a productive member of society and shit, you know. And Reconciliation. So he saw transformation at the highest level of humanity, whiteness. He saw it as a, as a contingent possibility at a step down Puerto Ricans. He saw it, he saw Leonard Peltier was innocent, um, but he didn't consider any of the, the folders on BLA people. So for me, and the only reason that Leonard Peltier stayed in prison was because the FBI told him, you know what we did to Frank Church back in 1975 when he led the CIA commission, you know, he could not get elected again. We understand your wife has taken a residency in New York and has designs to run for Senator there. And we will make sure she does not get Senator if you pardon Leonard Peltier. So he said, okay, no for that. What I'm trying to say is that there was psychic reciprocity in his mind between all those folders, except for the black political prisoners. He could not see good little girl, good little boy in 68, fell in with the wrong people, and now we want to do better. He just can't see a narrative arc of redemption in mm -hmm. black incarcerated people because he can't see a narrative arc of redemption in black people at all. And so he doesn't consider those. I thought at that moment, now we can go gangbusters because ain't nobody ever gonna pardon a BLA soldier. Mm -hmm. There are different opinions. And at the end of the day, uh, the prisoners themselves, because um, the prisoners were down with it, BLA mm -hmm. people outside of prison and inside of prison. And at the end of the day, they, they listened to counsel. And you know, if I'm locked up for 20, 30 years, right. I don't, I don't know I would make the difference. I, I want hope. You know, mm -hmm. if I know, I mean, if I can interject, you know, if I can interject on that note, I mean, for for such a activity as BLA, and, and I think the same could be argued about, um, though very different, the same could potentially be argued about people like Mandela. After spending enough time in prison, um, you, you're definitely not going to be able to play the role you used to play. Uh huh. You know? And, and that's an important point. And I'm not trying to take anything away from them, but at the very least, at the very minimum, we have to understand that, that they're, they've transitioned into a different part of the struggle. Whereas, you know, they were on the streets doing very particular things that they can no longer play that role at that point. And, and it's also, you know, I don't think that we should be looking for them or expecting them as people who are uh, physically compromised inside of cages, 
to to um, you know be our primary uh, uh, um, direction uh, in terms of our actions as people outside of cages who who are trying to continue a fight. You know, I don't think we should be expecting them to be you know uh, uh, putting their own you know, play their own family aside for for the sake of doing things that we're actually capable of doing ourselves. Quite well taken. Mm -hmm. And I'll, and also, uh, um, if you don't mind, I hope I'm not cutting you off. No, um, no, no. I, I didn't want to talk about this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm and I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that, but I think it's very important, and you know, we need to we. You know, we need to hear from people like that, and I'll take the blame for. <laughs> you know, if they come for you, you can say it was that it was that guy, man. He's a troublemaker. <laughs> but um, you know, and and um, you know, you mentioned uh, that we that we were on this um, that we were on this um, uh, we were working on this together, and um, and for people who may not know me. Uh, me and Shank, me and Frank have have actually shared a pretty close relationship uh, since I was a teenager, you know, and um, and I think I don't know, I must have been like fourteen or fifteen when we were working on that, anyway. And um, for me, um, you know, I was able to benefit from from learning from you and and studying with you at a very formative age, um, and at a transitional period for myself, you know. Um, at, during that time, I believe I was still on probation, and I, you know, had had spent some time in juvenile hall, et cetera, and even um, and even during that period, there was times that you came to court with me, and you know, uh, uh, one thing I can say about Frank is that you know, uh, it's not just theory. You know, I mean, this is someone who comes to court with 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 children who are you know the state's trying to put in cages, and you know, he came and was like a really uh, strong support for me when I was going through that. Um, and uh, I remember I remember being outside of the courtroom waiting for court to start. <laughs> and you're like, you know, uh, uh, if, you know, if you gotta if you gotta leave, if you need to get away, I'm gonna help you. <laughs> you know? And I remember you saying that and it was like an instant kind of relief because I was really I was feeling all this anxiety and stress about it. And it was like, OK, you know, like I got this OG cat with me. And he's got my back. So whatever I got to deal with, at least I know I got an elder that's got my back, you know. And um, and so that kind of brings me to the next question, which I want to ask. Um, you have um, you've mentioned the potential, the great potential in the black elderly and the black youth. And um, uh, I, I don't know if it was an interview or something you wrote recently, but we were talking about that amongst ourselves. And so I was uh, hoping uh, to get you to elaborate a little bit about, you know, the potential you see in the black youth and the black elderly, and and why those are two categories that you know that that are important to you, et cetera. Yes, well, if, if I'll put a plug in for my my book, Afro Pessimism, which just came out. <laughs> uh, Everyone, yeah. please buy the book. That's a very okay. significant book. Thank you, Tessie. Yeah. yeah. It, Question, Hannibal. Uh, I, I deal directly uh, with that question in chapter two, uh, called "Juice from a Neckbone," mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's it was a shocking moment in 1968. Uh, shocking in a pleasurable way to to hear my grandmother um, when she and I are sitting down watching rebellions. You know, after King has been killed. And she says, you know, she shouts, go ahead, son. You know, I look at TV and what she normally, because she's a sports fanatic, was a sports fanatic like me, you know. I thought, well, we're not watching baseball, football, you know, but she's she's cheering on a, a black dude with, with a conk and a do-rag snapper on his cock and no shirt on. And he's wheeling a shopping cart, you know, down a boulevard with shit's burning on either <laughs> side. <laughs> and so um, I thought, wow, you know, I mean. You know, that's something not that not just that she wouldn't have said, you know, 20 years ago when she was like in her 40s, but something she couldn't have said, mm -hmm. you know, because she was in, she was so perfected in psychoanalytic terms, psychically invested in um, the status of herself as a school teacher, as a jazz musician, 
as a mother of six children. Um, and it's this politics of responsibility and politics of respectability that she needs, which is really just Black people saying, I am shit scared, my kids are going to get killed. So I know there's no strategy to not get them killed, but I'm going to pretend there is and tell them just to be good Negroes, you know. And so mm -hmm. when she jumped out of that bag, it's like, oh, all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> none of the responsibilities, okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if she could run, but she can't, you know, she could get a Molotov cocktail and go downtown. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I think that, you know, it, it's a funny, tragic kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, um, especially for that professional class, when they get farmed out, you know, in other words, when they retire, and they realize, looking back, that uh, nothing happened of any significance in my life, except that I made some money and put food on the table. But I, but all my titles and everything did not uh, uh, bequeath to me recognition and incorporation. I'm still just a splib, you know. And and what happens is that's why you know I worked at a um, a, a, a retirement home in, in um, Oakland where um, there's Black people who were politically minded. We were writing a newsletter uh, with a woman uh, who was heading the project named Chino Sole. It was interesting because Chino Sole had been um, in UNITA. She's a Black American woman. She'd been in UNITA in Angola before it was taken over by the South Africans. And so she had an interesting story to tell. So we were working, and those people were angry. You know, they were not. They were not like angry about this policy or that policy. They're angry, mad at the world, and I think that that's. But, but that comes with a kind of bitterness also that my life was not a life that was recognized like my non-Black colleagues. I think that before people become like 20-ish, mm -hmm. they're Black, uh, that sense of energy and that sense of what Jarrett Sexton calls a process through which you assume the antagonism. It doesn't mean celebrate or mourn. It simply means assume that I am nothing in the world. I am the foil against which humanity makes itself. You know, it's at the first part of life, at the end of life, that mm -hmm. those things can come to the fore. In between, we're trying to we're trying to be somebody. You know. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go to. My next question, um, which is about um, writing, actually. Um, so, you know, you, you often used poems in your work. Um, in Asada Shakur's book, uh, she also uses poems. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the use of poetry, but also writing as a form? And how do you think about various various forms of writing that you engage in and how do you bring it all together i mean this is also the case in sort of your new book in your new text and um, and why do you think this is important to write this way or why do you end up writing this way where there is like the form itself has these different elements in it and i was wondering like how um what does it mean that, that if writing or text is a thing of the world uh, of this world, the way the world is organized already, uh, the basis of which is this antagonism that you write about, then writing itself, what, what is that as, as a Black person to write? Um, because if writing is from the world, then how do you engage with it as someone who has to use something from the world to write about it? And then, you know, the, the conditions of possibility of writing has these limits. So, you know, uh, so I want you to kind of engage with those observations, maybe. I mean, maybe I'm stretching it too much, but maybe you've thought about it already. But I see it in your writing constantly that it doesn't have, I mean, all this stuff you're talking about, about not having the narrative arc, for example, right? It's also showing, it coming up in your writing that it doesn't have this kind of usual narrative. It doesn't have this linear chronological structure that most writings have but also doesn't have the kind of fantastic type of writing that, you know, like magic realism of something. It's, it's something that's really deep and about black suffering always. Um, and it has 
this element in it, which, but I wanted to see more what you want to say about form in writing. And of course, beginning with the whole question of poems and poetry and all of that. Yes, well, thank you. I mean, poetry is really is is really important because um, for the for the most part, it does something uh, different than narrative. And I I don't so what I don't want to do is I don't want to cathedralize the emancipatory possibilities of poetry. Right. I want to talk about it can do something that's 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 different. Yeah. And so the the the. the in um, we we talked about uh, earlier in this broadcast um, two types of of signifying processes. There's secondary, which is how you and I and Hannibal are talking. And so I've got to make sure that when I speak, that it is grammatically sensible to you two. Otherwise, you're not going to hear what I'm saying. But I've got, but I've got another language going on inside of me that's actually driving my actions in ways that I cannot account for, and that's the language of the unconscious, and that's the language of desire, identification, tenacious fixation, anxiety, aggressivity, and um, typically, narrative works, but it doesn't get very close to that, typically because it because it has it has to make a kind of progressional sense. Okay, so that's that's number one. And so poetry then um, can can do a deeper form of what in psychoanalysis is called facilitation. And facilitation is that that point where um, logical speech meets illogical speech. Mm. 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 So, so so facilitate facilitation happens in all speech acts, but it is weakest in uh, expository writing and analysis and, 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 and narrative. And it is, it is strongest in uh, the, the, the babbling of a, of a schizophrenic, for example, mm -hmm. and, 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 and poetry, okay? So, so in other words, there's a, what, what, I, what I found in, um, in a lot of, of writing of, of people who I call my mentors, um, like Asada Shakur mm -hmm. and uh, James Baldwin um, uh, and Chester Hines, um, and, and um, is that they, they do a great job of getting close to something, and, but they're often things that they don't touch. Things that are too embarrassing, too sexual, too personal, and uh, and I wanted to find a way to go further because that's my job. To 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 as I when I tell people in creative writing workshops, um, your job is to stand in the middle as a writer, stand in the middle of the room, pour gasoline on yourself, and light a match. You know, in other words, you have to imagine. What is it about me, my situation, and my context that I'd be so embarrassed if someone else learned about and write that? Now you don't necessarily have to publish it, but you need to you need to go there. You need you need to be sacrificial in your performance on the page, sacrificial of yourself, you know. Um, so then to get back to narrative, narrative has a problem because whether it is the political narrative of, of say, uh, I'll just use the Marxist, for example, or the classical narrative of the capitalist bourgeois individual, at the level of content, they're very different because mm -hmm. there's loss, there, oh, sorry, there's plenitude, disequilibrium, and equilibrium restored right. for both of them, but they, one will restore a group of oppressed people, mm -hmm to sovereignty, self-determination, and the other, which is 99% of what you get, will restore individuals to bourgeois individualism. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's that arc, whether it's political or personal, that arc leading to a form of redemption that is not available to the black, to, to, to the black body. And so I, so I feel that I need to, uh, in incognito and in Afro-pessimism, mm -hmm. um, use the tools because the truth of my existence is, is an absolute foil to humanity. But that's mm -hmm. not the real 
totality of my existence. That's mm. the truth of my existence. The totality of my existence is all kinds of other shit, you know, like, like a bourgeois Southern California professor. Uh, mm. <laughs> you know, hey, uh, father, you, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you talk to us a little bit about, about that specifically, like how, what role, um, you know, or how how you see the issue of class in our current situation. How does it um, how does it you know inform or you know what should we understand about it the way that we're dealing with things uh, in the current situation? Class. Yes, class. Oh, okay. Let me um, let me just finish. Ten yeah. Yes. Then I, then, because it's gonna take me on a different. No, it's, it's fine. Oh yeah, go for it, go yeah. for it. Sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, didn't well, mean to distract. What I think about Kenzine's point, uh, question, was that, um, uh, I mean, we had it right here. Um, Truth versus totality, that's what oh, you yeah, were saying. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so so, so I, I live like other people who are not black. Mm -hmm. But I am not essentially like other people who are not black. I do not. I you know I I suffer in important ways like other people who are not black. I and this will lead us segue into what, what Hannibal is saying. Right. I suffer class oppression. Um, for example, I might even be the perpetrator of gender oppression. I might be the 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 actual source of gender oppression internal to blackness. So there, there are ways in which performatively, important ways in which performatively as a, as a cisgender heterosexual male, I might oppress women and I suffer class oppression. So those are, those are important aspects of the totality of my life, but mm -hmm. they are inessential to the truth of my life. The truth of my life is I have no access to hum to humanity because if I did, if I could become human, humanity would have no meaning. So, I, I so what that means is that the narrative arc, whether it's bourgeois classical narrative of the of the bourgeois individualism, or class, gender, sexuality colonial based nar narrative arcs of political and social redemption are both arcs for human beings, people who are given something that's put on calls ontological resistance, right? Mm -hmm. They're given a place. Right. The Afghan boy is given a place. It's a degraded place. Mm -hmm. It's a place. Justice Taney says, look, Dred Scott's going back to prison, going back to slavery because he's not human and being not human, he cannot be a subject of jurisprudence. He says, let me tell you what I mean by that. The Native American is human and they can actually have a full-fledged place in civil society if they learn white ways. You can't teach black people white ways because Africa is a place of non-community, of non-personness, you know, non okay? And so that's the truth of the existence. The totality is Dred Scott might've become free if one lower court had let him go, and he might have made a million dollars and um, owned uh, Ebony Magazine one day, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't change the truth of his of his existence. And so, uh, segueing then into into Hannibal's uh, uh, question, maybe you could restate it, Hannibal, so I don't go off on a tangent. Sure, of course. So um, basically, just trying to understand the role that class is, is playing in the way that we're dealing with the current situation. Um, and this is, and this is a question from my father too. So, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, we've kind of had some of these conversations, but you know, we've talked in depth about a lot of this stuff, but, um, you know, I think it's something that a lot of, uh, people who are engaging with Afro pessimism, and you know, engaging with um, anti-blackness, et cetera, and trying to think through these things, a lot of times there's a tendency to like flatten out or, or erase class. And so um, we're hoping maybe you can talk a little bit about how um, there is this tendency among, uh, you know, like middle-class blacks to distance themselves from uh, poor blacks and, and um, 
like from more people in a more abject poverty, et cetera. Um, and what role does that play in the way that we organize ourselves, the, the way that we respond to, you know, like riots, for example, or, you know, any number of issues that are that are becoming more and more um, in the, you know, in people's minds and becoming more and more prominent. Okay, so shout out to Greg Caldwell. <laughs> and uh, thank you for that. Um, well, I, I think you kind of said it, Hannibal. Um, there's a, I, I would put it uh, succinctly uh, and say that black politics tends to be driven by the personas in the black middle class. And um, I would also argue that that process is also, uh, is exemplary of a, of a kind of slave process in which a larger formation in civil society has through, through not, not through so-called direct means, but sometimes through direct means has selected the people for us who will speak. And the selection can be um, kind of um, indirect by just like who can, in a situation like this, who can come on CNN, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I remember in 1989, um, I was living in New York and uh, all of a sudden, like three people rock up in the New York Times, Jesse Jackson and, and two other milk toast Negroes, who I can't remember uh, <laughs> their, their names, you know, and start, and start demanding that uh, we switch, that everybody in publishing switch from uh, African, Black to African American. Mm. And I was like, what? You know, who elected you? I mean, you're only on the scene because you get to talk to the New York Times, uh, mm -hmm. because you get to talk to, to CNN at a positive level and at a negative level is because COINTELPRO killed all the legitimate people that, mm -hmm. that, that speak in our, our community. So so you emerge in this, in this kind of moment. And um, they were taking polls in, the South Side of Chicago and in Harlem, where I was living, you know, and these polls in these uh, highly concentrated black areas, which were not middle class, were saying seventy to ninety percent of these people wanted to stay with the word black. Mm -hmm. So the polls were contradicting the campaign of highly placed notables uh, like Jesse Jackson and. Uh, these people campaigned, I mean, they campaigned from 89 all through 90 and part of 91, and they won. Right. They won. You know, they kept saying, well, black is not, a, black doesn't make a cultural identity. But, and, and what we need to say is like, yeah, you're right, because there's no black culture, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people can't recognize blackness for nonsense in chapter one. I wish I could speak Wolof, because I'd have a greater mm -hmm. connection of my dreams and my cosmology. But damn, when Wolof is spoken, everyone else just says that's a black language. And when you put black on front of language, it, it cancels out the noun, you know? It cancels mm -hmm. out, like in the movie Mandalay, you know, um, every black person on a slave is, is given an adjective in the book, but the, but the noun is nigger, okay? So weeping nigger, crying nigger, okay? <laughs> Deceptive nigger, diabolical nigger, you know? I mean, that's very important. They're all very different in the in the totality of their life, but the truth of their life is N I G G E R, which has no <laughs> which has no resonance with any other noun in the symbolic order. Okay, and so what these people are do consciously or unconsciously is not political organizing, but anger management. Mm -hmm. That's a like a managerial class type of thing. You know, we're seeing that we're seeing that in Minnesota happening soon enough, trying to calm down all the black militants and so on. Yeah, okay. you know, it man, there's so much in what you just said that's really interesting. I think a lot of our uh, viewers will appreciate the reference to Fanon and Wolof too. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's actually pretty significant to some of us. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's a, so I had another question, and it wasn't it wasn't necessarily in our sequence, I'm kind of jumping in front of Tanzim because I feel like you touched on it, 
with the question of African American, right? So, you know, and I'm kind of familiar a little bit, not in as much detail um, as how you just talked about um, with the African American debate and campaign, et cetera, right? But now we have this thing, and I don't know if you're familiar or not, but now there's this thing, uh, American descendants of slaves, uh, which is like, <laughs> Like they don't even want to be African American. Like they don't want to be black, and and they don't want to have um, like this connection as like you know like you know any connection to like a global kind of politic or or generalized uh, blackness, et cetera. But there's um, a movement of people who who are. Um, I mean, I don't even know exactly how to characterize this because to be honest with you, man, it's so. It, it's so like uh, counter to to the way that I think, right? It's, it's hard for me to think about at times. But um, have you, are you familiar with, with ADOS, African, uh, American Descendants of Slavery? Um, yeah. And if so, you know, how, what, what, what's like an Afro-pessimist understanding of, of this phenomenon? I, I haven't formulated one yet. Um, to, be, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fly running by the seat of my pants here during Two of two of these, sometimes three and four of these podcasts are a week right now. Yeah, and we constantly. I was, yeah, I was introduced. Uh, I'd heard about them, of course, uh, but I hadn't really gone to the website and and looked at it so much until um, March twenty fifth, when the two brothers from uh, San Diego State University. I did a, a thing with them on Facebook, um, and so I, so. Um, uh, I think that when you say, so I want to say two things, because because where I'm at now in terms of affect and the way I act publicly is to, uh, is kind of different than where I was when you knew me back in the day. <laughs> yeah, so let me just say, and for anyone listening, like, it, you know, I'm, I'm asking this question, so I realize that I'm, I'm really putting you on the spot, and, and answer it like whatever you think is best i don't I, i'm not looking for you to denounce them or okay. or or to create any any conflict but really just um trying to th think think on the theoretical level you know yeah i i think that um i'm i'm there with black people for anything they do that pushes against the system but when I'm in it, this thing that they might be doing, I'm often, I'm always trying to uh, work like like the communists worked in the ANC back in the day, you know, 50,000 communists, you know, when they were real communists, uh, wanted to overthrow capitalism, and, and you had to sign up for that, and you join the Communist Party, and then you must join the African National Congress to influence the debates in the African National Congress to move away from social uh, so, uh, social democracy towards communism. And so I really see, uh, I would hope that Afro-pessimists um, would, um, would instantiate themselves in all sorts of, of Black political movements um, to help broaden and, and um, deepen the scope of, of, of analysis. Uh, and I think that that kind of uh, generosity of spirit with the debates happening in, internally uh, does a lot because all black speech is speech under coercion. Every black person is in a prison cage wherever they are um, trying to modulate, well, what is this gonna mean if I say this and how they got, you know? And so, and, and I think that we have not had enough time to give ourselves permission to be in it, but not of it. And so, because we are not, um, we are not even in these places like South Africa, where you could, you know, hit an oil refinery and then dash across the border to uh, a safe haven in, in, in Zambia. You know, there's just, there's, there's, there's no, even quasi liberated zones. So it's just, it's really hard for the mind to think I am completely against this American project at all levels of abstraction because mm -hmm. 
the mind is a conservative entity, as I talked to you before, in, in the pre-conscious interest. The right. pre-conscious is always saying, and then what, dude? Mm -hmm. and then what? You know, mm -hmm. and the unconscious is saying, I don't give a damn, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so, and so um, and the pre-conscious is saying, but you got children, you know, and you got a mortgage, you got rent, you know. And so, um, and then and the and the unconscious is saying, well, I don't give a damn. The pre-conscious is saying, and they will kill you, you know. So mm -hmm. I think that um these are all good starting points. And what I was trying to say in my film, Reparations Now, and in, the, in those days I was kind of talking with people in Incobra, is to say, once you concretize slavery in an experience or in a place in space and time, then you've, 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 you've impoverished your ability to think of slavery as a relational dynamic. And so when you say American descendants of Blacks, you've impoverished yourself from thinking about a Black immigrant as a slave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you get right back to empiricism, mm -hmm. observation, and historical fact, and you move away from the paradigmatic relation. It's like being a, 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 a flat-footed Marxist and saying capitalism happens on the factory floor. Mm -hmm. No, capitalism happens in the zeitgeist, in the liberal economy, on the factory floor. Um, it, 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 relation, you know, this is what the humanities could do if it was revolutionary, because it allows us to see structural violence as opposed to being what we normally do as Americans, American trained intellectuals and, and British trained intellectuals are the worst for this, always pointing mm -hmm. to the anecdote to prove the theoretical structure, you know, and that leads you into deep, deep trouble. And so I think that, um, that we have to realize that we're making these reparations movements and struggles for ourselves to conscientize ourselves, to organize ourselves, to give ourselves a better understanding of how we suffer. And that we're paying lip service. And when we say we want this, like 40 acres and a mule, or we want hundred thousand dollars, we want this, or, or we want blacks in America to be recognized. That's just, we don't, we're bullshit. You know, like we have to be able to say that that's just the front that we use to get this out there to, to make contact with other people or get in the press. But if we really believe that, then we have, we have, we have hurt ourselves in terms of the power of explanation and we've fed our frustration because what if we got that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we would still be slaves. <laughs> Yeah, that's an excellent point. And it's something that, you know, um, I'm, it's continually coming to mind because with all of the uh, rioting and looting that's um, sweeping the nation, you find people uh, stepping up who essentially it's, it's like they want to use rioting and looting that they actually are not a part of. They want to use it like a bargaining chip for, um, you know, some tangible reconciliation, which I mean, the way I understand it, the rioting and the looting is is antagonistic. It's not a, um, you know, it's not about trying to reconcile. Um, you know, it's not about trying to. If I can rephrase, you know, like like there's some people who are saying, well, we just want the officers charged, mm -hmm. but that neglects the fact that the judges are are worse than the officers. The judges right. and the district attorneys who are going to charge the officers are actually worse or criminals than the officers because they provide an elaborate system of cover for the officers who are largely just idiots with guns mm -hmm. and they provide this elaborate system to protect them. So, okay, we're gonna use this rioting and looting as a bargaining chip to put these, put, to put these cops before district attorneys and judges, et cetera, um, whereas, I mean, the judges, district attorneys, and what have you are, are, are even more culpable. And it's like, they're even worse a problem than the police. If it was just the police, like we would deal with the police ourselves. We would handle them and, and there would be no more police, but they have this elaborate system of protection. And so, so people are saying, well, you know, this rioting and looting is happening because, you know, you, you district attorneys 
and you judges are, are, are not doing the right thing, but it's like, it, they, you know, their whole purpose is to do the wrong thing. Exactly, exactly. Frank, I want to ask a question about uh, films. Um, you're a filmmaker and a theorist of films. One of your books is about films. And I wanted to, um, maybe you, you could introduce to our viewers um, how you think about film. You know, we talked about writing as a form, but film as a form, as a genre even. And, uh, and also in relation to we've been seeing because of the rise of like uh, new technologies of being able to take uh, videos of killings so quickly that there's everyone is sort of like this almost like a filmmaker, they record the, these deaths, black deaths uh, by the police, and then it's up and... So this whole question of the distance between the observer and what they're seeing and the world, the question of the image, the question of the film. So it's an open question sort of for you to kind of talk to us a little bit about the film as a form and how you think about all of that. Well, I... I oh. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very important question. Um, part of why I'm, why I'm hesitating is because it, 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 it points to a contradiction within myself. You know, in other words, I'm aware of the contradiction, um, but I'm, I'm just saying that there's a lot of people who have this contradiction and are not aware of it. And that is the, the sense that, that, that one fundamentally believes uh, if one is not aware, or one wants to believe, if one is aware like me, that if you have photographic evidence, you can move forward with some kind of transformative project. You know, mm -hmm. you no longer about, nah, maybe it happened this way, maybe it happened this way, you know. Ah, we got it, right here. White dude's knees on the neck of this guy, we, we see him from life to death, just bleeding out, so to speak, breathing out, so, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. That's gonna, wow, that's gonna do it. Well, we get photographic evidence every single year. Right. Just, we're, we're, as you said, we're, we're just awash with photographic evidence. And a few years ago, I would think, well, nothing changes. Now I realize, no, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. As I, I think some cultural historian 100 years now will, from, from now will plot a graph saying, with, which will show that the, that, the, that the lines of photographic evidence moving up like this have a parallel line of the of intensification and, and increase of, of mm -hmm. black moving with it, which was from a logical jurisprudential standpoint should be the opposite. These two lines right. should cross, you know? Right. Um, right. And it really gets back to the fact that um, if it was anyone else, there's a possibility for the evidence to in some way intervene in the frequency of the murders in some way. I won't say what it is because that will depend upon the level of exaltation or degradation of that human species, you know? Right, right, right. right. It would be slow for brown people and faster if you've got mm -hmm. photographic evidence for East Asian people, you know? Right. But the fact is that it's going to be, there is transformative capacity in the symbolic labor of the image for everyone who is not Black. And right. so, you know, in this, in this book, Afro-Pessimism, I open it with a psychotic episode mm -hmm. uh, that I had 20 years ago at the age of 44 where I just went crazy you know and and it really had a lot to do with with understanding dude I was political work in the North Bay and and the uh critical theory at UC Berkeley mm -hmm. and so understanding wow in the libidinal economy in the collective unconscious at the level of primary forms of signification the visual mutilation of black bodies is a form of pleasurable and lethal consumption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it produces communal connections. Mm -hmm. It doesn't disturb them. And this is a point that David Marriott uh, makes mm -hmm. uh, in On Black Men, the first chapter, Lynching and Photography. The mm -hmm. circulation, and he's just talking about a, he's talking about a still image. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. right. 
Polaroid snapshot in the first half of the 20th century, pasted on a postcard or a newspaper. He said, the circulation of that heightens the awareness of anyone looking at it that there's a structural divide between not quite human hanging in the tree and the human on the ground. It actually, the actual image and its circulation is uh, part and parcel of the fabric of mm -hmm. communal existence. Right. So what is happening is that we're having an intensification of anti-Black community through the plethora and distribution of these snuff videos that theoretically should impact on that. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. it, and, and in my second book, I, you know, for my sins, uh, I watched about a hundred Hollywood films. <laughs> right. And uh, and what I found was like, wow, Jack, you know, a black person gets mutilated or killed or beaten in one scene. Then you cut to the next scene. And nine times out of 10, the next scene is completely divorced emotionally from what just happened. In other words, there's not an image of people at funerals, mm -hmm. uh, survivors mourning, uh, reflection on the life of that person. And this is not a conspiracy theory. Right. It's, it's like, like Hannibal said, if it's just the pigs, we could deal with them, you know? This is an institutional analysis. It's like, there's no, there are not five men in the basement of a Hollywood studio saying, okay, we're gonna beat up black bodies on screen right. and move to something else. Um, it's unconscious, yeah. It's unconscious. Mm -hmm. And I, I start looking at Latinos and you know Asians, and I said, as you move up the food chain, there's mm -hmm. more and more reflection, but there's statistically speaking, none with respect to blackness. And it, it, and it does not matter if the director is white, black, or Asian. Right. Washington does the same things in the film that he directs, okay? Right. Uh, uh, Lee, Lee, yeah. Yeah, and Lee Daniels, I call him Lee Uncle Tom Daniels, the producer who created Monsters Ball, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he told these white boys who wrote the script, he said, look, look what, look what you got here, man. This script has been rejected seven times. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's this black boy who ends up in a relationship with Billy Bob Thornton after he, he the executioner and Halle Berry, you know, mm -hmm. and that doesn't feed um, the pornotropic need of the spectator. You got to get rid of the black boy. You got to have her as a concubine situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they just, the black boy actually literally became roadkill. They just killed him on the road like a, like a possum. And there was no reflection on right. his, it allowed for the psychic need of, of civil, and he also said you can't cast, uh, you know, uh, someone like Angela Bassett, someone who reads Black That's parents. Right. You gotta cast someone who reads biracial, so that the pornotropic imagination of the spectator is titillated and, br and, and brought in. You know, so all those mm -hmm. things. There's Black death happening right. on screen all the time, and it doesn't. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't evoke or elicit a, a response of moral indignation. It might for liberals in the pre-conscious, but in the unconscious, everyone say, damn, isn't that, whoa, that's pretty right. cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And, it, and if it happened, if, or if it happened to me, I would have had to have done something. Right. Right. Ms. G. Um. Tenzi, we got a question from the audience. I'll ask if, if you didn't want, if you had anything to follow up. No, no, go ahead. I, I have stuff, but go ahead. I mean, let's let's respond to some of the audience stuff if you have. Yeah, so um so uh this question we got here is um how do we and I think there might be a word missing. Yeah. Um how is the allure, I think, is probably a way animal. How is the allure of reform obsolete for Black folks? And, um, or how do we make the allure of reform obsolete for Black folks and have us understand the importance of destroying the world as we know it? That must be an Afro-pessimist, <laughs> whoever asked that question. 
Yeah. Um, why don't you two help me out here? What, what do you think is being asked in this question? I think the question is, What's what like? How do we how do we get away from um, the seduction of like uh, updating and um, like you know uh, uh, um, making making a you know a progressive slave plantation? Like how do we how do we as as black people as people serious about about struggle against slavery etc. How do we get away from this like compensatory measures? You know, like there's this incessant uh, desire to to like reform the situation, right? And and make like fix fix the relationship and, and reconcile the relationship versus like like making it fall to pieces versus like embracing that the whole the whole framework and and the whole assumption is is fundamentally uh, death for us. You know, that's the way I understood it, uh, and I hope I'm doing justice to the ad person asked the question. I think it's a really good question. I'm just, you know, I I I feel like I should know the answers to everything that's asked me, and sometimes <laughs> I actually don't. Um, here's what I think. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I mean, I I think that every black person is an Afro pessimist at some moment in every day. And then uh, something happens where a corrective kicks in. And um, I don't mean corrective in a derogatory way. I just mean something happens and you, you know, like, like, okay, what am I going to do with that right now? You know, like I've, I, I'm just going to be honest with the viewers. I've never known how to, um, um, to teach Afro-pessimism right. uh, uh, my daughters. And, you know, because I see, because what happens is that that's the essential dynamic of my being, but then the important dynamic of my being kicks in, which is you got to help them uh, manage their lives and go to school and, uh, you know, not go off. So I, bec I, I may slip into that whole anger management thing because I'm trying to provide some kind of semblance of sanctuary and a process for being safe that I know doesn't exist. Um, so I think that Afro-pessimism is, um, it's a diagnostic of suffering and it doesn't have anything to say about how to get free. Mm. Because to be free is to be free of the world to be free of everyone else's capacity to make life. It's not just to be free of the conditions that um, my man Floyd experienced. It's not just to be free of the conditions of racism. It's to be free of everyone else's capacity to be who they are. To be who they are as families, to be who they are as cultures, to be who they are as religions, to be who they are as nations. It's, 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 it is possible, but it is not possible to narrate mm -hmm. because we are in, we are under an epistemological umbrella and we understand that those are constructed. They're not divine ordained by God, uh, God but, but everything inside of an episteme um, it's like chess. There are, there are, you may think that there are infinite chess moves that you could make precisely because you don't know them. But in point of fact, there are finite, there are finite number of moves that you can make. For one, you cannot go off the board, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and you can't jump pieces like checkers. And, um, and so the, the finite number of chess moves that you will never know because they're in the perhaps millions, but they are finite, exist in the fact that every chess piece has its own capacity. Okay, the pawn has, is, is vested with these, even when the board is still, it's vested with the capacity to move two spaces forward on the first move, 
one space to the left, one space to the right, diagonally on the next move. The queen is tested with the capacity to move across the board like this. The, the, the rook or the knight must move like an L shape, okay? So capacity is invested, the power of capacity is invested in all the pieces regardless of what they what they what their movement is and most people can become liberated in this world mm. by changing the moves mm -hmm. and altering the the kind the the the, the, uh, the 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 locus of different capacities but black people can only become liberated by ending the capacity for everyone else and destroying the chessboard mm -hmm. which means that you're in the chessboard but you're not a chess piece. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, and you know that the, the whole game of chess must be eliminated for you to be liberated. But the thing is that you can't go off the chessboard and look back at the world of chess to say what that might be, because you're mm -hmm. in it. Right. And that's that's really that's a hard thing to live with every day. Okay, I am one of the people who write about this. I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't live with it every day, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got my diversions, okay? <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got my way of pretending to be human because that's, because when I, the moment when I, when it, when it came crashing in, I was at the psych ward at, 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 at the mm -hmm. tank center at UC Berkeley, okay? Um, that was the pure moment, you know? And I, and I had to, I had to get, quotation marks saying mm -hmm. so that I could go back to class right and live my death in a veiled manner yeah um and let me ask a question uh can i just jump in how, yes, how are you doing on time frank I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's Saturday, I'm free, whatever y'all want. Yeah, well, oh, okay. not like three more hours, but you know. We <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it could be exhausting to talk about some of these things because you kind of have to go back to this question of the truth um, that you are constantly kind of hitting, right? The truth of non-existence in a way, the truth of being entrapped permanently in some ways. Um, so yeah, please let us know when it feels like, okay, this, that's enough for today. But uh, I have a question um, which I have to kind of read. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of, it's this stuff that you're talking about, but perhaps there's a little bit of expansion that would be helpful. Um, in your new book, uh, you talk about um, not, about the condition of not having the origin story. And, you know, the, the, there is all this stylistic things in the book where you're changing from personal lived stories to what you call meta theory, the theory of theory. And uh, it seems like that itself, that kind of stylistic thing is itself an attempt to deal with that absence of the origin story. So it comes out kind of imminently from within your writing. Um, and towards the end of the book you write, and here I'm quoting you, you marry white, it doesn't change. You change your slave name, you turn your white Jesus to the wall, it doesn't change. You marry black, it still doesn't change. For it to stop, it would have to have started. You go through life not knowing your desire from theirs, like a man being lynched and forced to eat his severe penis while telling the lynchers lording over him how good it tastes. And you see yourself as a phobic object in need of self-destruction for someone else's safety. That someone is you, but also not you. What do you do with, with an unconscious that appears to hate you, end quote. I mean, that's a very powerful, uh, I mean, of course it's psychoanalytic, but at the same time, it even is able to objectify the whole paradigm of psychoanalysis itself from the positionality of the slave. And if you could talk about this, this absence of origin story, all these attempts that always fail, and it's clear that it does, the question of the unconscious and how the unconscious itself appears to hate the slave and uh, the way you have to write, which is 
almost like an impossible way to write, right? And yeah, I just wanted to, that was, when I read that paragraph, that really kind of, it jumped out of the page and was it was not easy to, even as a reader, to deal with that. But uh, whatever you want to do, do with that passage, it, it's free, basically, however you want to deal with it. Um, so I want to say to your, your viewers that um, uh, it, because this is a book that was, you know, has to be written for um, someone whose education and vocabulary level is like a junior in college. It's not, you know, I had to, I, it's a trade book from a New York trade publisher. So part of the difficulty was writing this without the theoretical language and processes that some of my other work has been written in so that more people could um, understand what's being said here and um, hopefully go to some of the people that I quote. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that um, in the passage that you just read, there's a lot of that, which is like my words, my original writing. And there's some of that that is lifted from David Marriott. Yeah. And, um, and in order to, so no one's going to know that because in a trade book, they don't want footnotes cluttering up the prose. So the only way that you know it, at the very end, you see like, what do you do with an unconscious, I hate you, right? That's not a quotation, but you'll see then in the, in the actual end notes that it comes from David Marriott's um, article right. after uh, France Fanon's war. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, what aspect of that would you like me to address, Kenzine, for, for example? um the origin story yes not being there yeah. interrupting your writing and making your writing what it is and how the unconscious hates you and that realization is there while still having to write and still having to be while you're non-being let's say to use the Afro pessimist language. So again, maybe that's still vague, but no, no, it's not vague. There's there's just a lot there, and I'm trying to figure yeah. out how where I where I enter. Um so in in a in a in a critical theory piece I wrote on the Black Liberation Army um, for a German uh publication, one of the things that I I, I say was that if you actually look at what the Black Liberation Army did in terms of its insurgent operations, okay? Um, it really didn't hurt the American infrastructure nearly as much as if you look at what the IRA did and what the, the um, uh, uh, Red Army faction in Germany did. Right. How, so then I ask the question, so why is it that anxiety over BLA insurgency in the liberal economy is higher. There's a there's if you you know if you read police reports, uh, a declassified document from the intelligence part of the of the Maryland police, right. uh, FBI reports. You know, there's this hyper anxiety about a group of people that may have been 400 at most in highly decentralized cells that probably launched 66 insurgent operations, of which at least half were jailbreaks and not, you know, I mean, you know, it's like, it's not like they blew up the Capitol and shit like that, you know, right. it's like, I mean, they did damage, but it's, yeah. but it's not. And then you, you go to the Bader Meinhof and like, damn, they blew up NATO bases. Uh, right. Uh, the, the, the German embassy in Sweden. Right. Uh, a major news publication shooting police in the streets, you know, just um, execution style. And yet all the stuff that I learned in my year in Germany was that the zeitgeist and the kind of libidinal economy of the establishment mind was like, these are our wayward children, mm, you know, mm, mm. These are our wayward children. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and so, and so, already in their embedded in, in their own police action, 
and press action against the Red Army faction is an origin story that once they were part of our larger filio mm -hmm. context, mm -hmm. and then they went astray. The same thing that we were able to do for the Weather Underground, right? Okay. Right, then. Mm -hmm. you know? The other thing is, uh, so, so there's always this origin story that, that, is, that is happening from the police state in the way that it thinks about um, the insurgent activity of revolutionary groups, you know, they, they can chart that. But when it comes to what is the BLA doing? Mm -hmm. what, and what do they want? You find that the narrative of these police reports just goes haywire. In other words, they cannot find the origin of the complaint or they can't even concretize what it is. Right. Okay? And so that runs parallel to the fact that there are people, uh, uh, grad students I've worked with, like um, uh, uh, Parisa Vaziri, mm -hmm. uh, who has shown us how um, Iran can't develop mm -hmm. a cultural coherence without anti-Black slavery, that these two, these two things go, go hand in hand. The Arab slave trade from 625 AD to giving it over to the Portuguese doesn't just destroy black bodies, but it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is, it is uh, inextricably bound with the development of what it means to be, to be in that, in that community. But mm -hmm. the, point, the point that that cannot be answered and should not be tried to be answered, I would say is what, why did they pay black people? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would argue that, that they did not pick black people. Blackness emerges as a position with the Arab slave trade. There were no Blacks, there was no Africa prior to that. Mm -hmm. There were Olaf, mm -hmm. Ashanti, Buganda, Maasai, Shona, and the belly. But Blackness is not a thing, an, a social formation at all. It's mm -hmm. certainly a social formation that has an existence prior to social death, which means that blackness corrupts or distends the analysis of Orlando Patterson because Orlando Patterson tells an origin story of slavery when he uses the verb recruit. When mm -hmm. he says slaves, however they are recruited, mm -hmm. a Moor is on his knees on the banks of Tunis and a crusader is about to behead him and he's saying, would you like social death or would you like real death? The more has been, whether this person is Berber or Egyptian or Arab, has been, has been, is been being recruited into social death. In other words, there's a prior existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is no prior existence to blackness. And so this is the most besetting hobble of trying to write because narrative as a structure comes with to us ideologically laden. It says all people, and this isn't just my saying this, this is, uh, you know, uh, Sadia Hartman has written this and yes. seen the section in an interview I did with her in 2002, you know. In other words, the slave cannot be implanted in narrative, but we still write stories because what she's saying and what I'm saying is that the truth of black existence is anathema to the truth of narrative, because mm. narrative is about subjects. Mm -hmm. However, the totality of Black existence involves a lifestyle of what Jared Sexton calls borrowed institutionality, mm -hmm. trying to be subjects. We're very good storytellers, okay? Mm -hmm. But we don't, but, but we, we, when we have a redemptive moment at the end of a story that we tell, we can only have that by negating or disavowing what the story has been about. And mm -hmm. that is, and that's not always our fault. That's right. not always our fault because there's no such thing as a black publishing industry. And most editors and publishers will demand some form of resolution at the end or else you can just mimeograph your book on a little mimeograph machine and pass it out to your friends. <laughs> you know what I'm that's, you know. which, which we do, which we do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, so I think that that's 
part of it. And what, and what David Marriott has done in particular is he's taken what I've just said and he's shown us how that works at the, I think the lowest level of abstraction, which is inside the psyche. And he says that one of the things about the psychoanalytic cure, and we don't throw Marxism out with the bathwater. We don't throw psychoanalysis out with the bathwater sure. because, because we haven't found uh, people, I think there's something very valuable about the work that is done it has been done since 1899 when Freud and Brewer wrote Notes on Hysteria. I think there's something very valuable about the work that has gone on to explain the unconscious. But on the other side of that explanation is a thing that does not exist in Afro-pessimism, which is the prescriptive gesture, which is how to cure the adolescent or how to liberate the oppressed person. Because that would mean that you are a chess piece, not mm -hmm. outside the world of chess, right? You could think about that, you know? Let's, mm -hmm. let's give some power of the queen, some mm -hmm. movement of the queen to the pawns, you know what I'm saying? Let's distri distribute equally this, 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 this capacity on the chessboard. Well, that can happen for an degraded and oppressed human being. But if you say to me, I have no capacity, mm -hmm. that's another problematic. And so what happens with the black person is that what Mary is saying, there's something about eating your, having your penis cut off mm -hmm. and while you're eating it, telling the lynchers how much you enjoy it. That actually happened. Marriott writes about that in On Black Men. And what he's trying to do with that is say, this process is a metaphor for the way in which cure might be impossible for the black psyche because you cannot find, the black psyche is always at war with itself. In other words, the ego ideal inside the mind, who am I, what do I wanna be, cannot be black, it cannot be black. This is what Lacan and Freud haven't understood, right? right. They understood it through their own racism, but you know, they haven't understood it through race. It can't, the ego ideal cannot be black. So if you're trying to help someone's unconscious recover, they cannot find an ego ideal within their community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even after the years of psychoanalysis. And so, and the mind tells one that one has to guard against the encroachment of the black imago. So that's a hell of a place to be in when your unconscious is saying, you cannot, you cannot have a, your, your own imago as a destination for the ego ideal and you must guard against yourself, you know? And, and so, um, this is, I mean, this is what, what Karen in Central Park was, 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 was doing, you know, which is, right. so this is why, why David Marriott, and this is the epigraph to the section that you, that you read, uh, Tanzine, I'll just, he says, um, yeah. they cannot, meaning black people, they cannot love themselves as black, but are made to hate themselves as white. Mm -hmm. And it's the word made, which carries the structural violence that infuses itself at every level of abstraction, whether you're walking down East Hennepin, I'm sorry, East Lake Street in Minneapolis and had to get a knee put in your neck, whether you're a transgender woman who's black in Missouri getting shot for no reason, or whether you're a black professional on the couch in your analytic session, mm -hmm. trying to cure yourself through psychoanalysis. The, the, you cannot love yourself as black but are made to, the cultural imposition that says, how do you exist? Mm -hmm. you exist as the imago through which everyone else can send the destination of aggressivity to resolve the conflicts of their own community, whether that community is filial or affilial. Okay, that's where you are, which is to say that, and, and you cannot say how you got here, mm -hmm because there was never a before here. Right. That's the problem with the origin story and it's the problem with narrative. And so, um, but I don't, but I don't then throw narrative out because I'm an anti, you know, I, I, I use it and distend it in ways that I need to, just like even though Marx is wrong, if we end capitalism, we'll end anti-Black. Mm -hmm. No, that ain't right. 
but I'm still an anti-capitalist. Right, of course, of course. No, thank you so much for that response. A lot to think about. I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm going to think about is what did it mean for someone like Fanon as a clinical uh, practitioner of psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to when he's dealing with white patients. And from the perspective of those white patients, what, who is Fanon, you know? And yes. it, it's something uh, that's hard to grasp. And I, I think it requires a lot of dueling on that. Um, if Fanon were here, uh, or, or right now, he's, he's probably rolling in his grave mm -hmm. to, to listen to the way in which Alpha Pessinger has hijacked his humanistic project. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, I always try to ignore the last chapter in Black Skin, White Mask. Yeah, yeah but I would tell Fanon, I would say to Fanon, like when I die and meet him wherever we are, you know, I say, look, dude, if you really want to understand what you wrote, Read David Marriott. Because <laughs> you really didn't understand what you were getting at, you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, Tenzin, did you want to follow up on that one? No, no, no. This is this is great. Uh, okay. I, I have the answer. So, so we've got a couple other things, um, uh, and this is and this is from my father again. Um, some comments he made a while ago so there was a lot in between that but um when we were talking about um this and i feel like we're kind of still on that same thread of like this need to have like a reconciliation at the end of at the sort of you know this arc of of you know coming back into humanity type thing right um and you know understanding understanding that and um and um uh, 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 dealing with like dealing with the reality of of that sort of like being outside of um you know a capacity to to like reconcile back into humanity um so and it's from uh my father again greg caldwell so he's saying a couple of things here which i'm just gonna try to get through real quick one, um, as a parent, uh, there are those times that you must accept the fact that truth is painful to your children. And there's little that you can do to reduce that pain. Um, so that's one thing, you know, that we got to kind of um, marinate on. Um, and then he's asking a question of, of um, how do we start a collective pro uh, how do we start a collective deprogramming process? And I'm assuming that he's talking about deprogramming from the need of a reconcile a reconciliation with society or a reconciliation with the the slave world, you know, the world of slavery, et cetera, that we exist in. And um, you know, how do we uh, start a collective process to deprogram ourselves from that need of of, of reconciliation, et cetera? Yeah, um, thank you, Greg. Um, what I want to say, I, I know, I know Greg uh, very well, um, just like I know you, Hannibal, very well. And and I was uh, for a, a while, I, I, I was on Greg's uh, committee, and he was doing a PhD. But I also um, saw um, how he parented, and I'm just going to say that I'm a little embarrassed to say that that he parented better than I parented uh, in, 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 in the sense that now to my own credit, I didn't have the books and stuff that he had, uh, you know, and, and the, but he, he just did a better job. What I mean by that is that as a Marxist in the late eighties uh, and nineties, I tried to instill my daughter um, with a sense of a redemptive narrative which is that once we um, destroy the apartheid state, she's, a, she's South African, once we destroy the apartheid state and uh, destroy capitalism, I used to use this word racial capitalism um, as because I thought that capitalism was the central truth of everyone's suffering, that um, 
our suffering as a family in South Africa would uh, be alleviated. Um, when I knew Greg, that was not the line that he was given to you and Ambriel, <laughs> you know, and Jennifer, okay? So I wish I could, I mean, we are who we are. We develop our understanding and we try to do better as we go on. Um, but he's absolutely, but my, but my kids are, they're grown. So it's, you know, um, uh, but he's absolutely right. I mean, it's this heartbreaking thing where you think you have a job to do as a father. You think you have a job to do as a mother. And one side of your brain knows that you're not a father, you're not a mother, um, you can't possibly be one. And uh, yet you still try to play that, I don't, and I don't mean don't provide for your kids. I mean, you still try to play that teaching role, you know, like let's have the talk, the talk about how do you deal with the police? Well, goddamn. He did everything right the other day and they still kneeled on his neck and, and, and killed him. There's nothing you can do, you know? And yet good parenting says, you can't be that nihilistic. Well, the point that, that Greg is making, which is a point that I took from him when I learned from him, but I had not inculcated when I was raising kids in formative years. The point is that the kid's gonna find that out anyway. They're gonna find that out anyway. And then they're gonna wonder, why did you lie to them? You know, why did you try to soft shoot this? You know, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's I, think, I think that the deprogramming, I actually don't know um, tactically or organizationally how to go about this deprogramming. Because I honestly think that you can teach people to be, um, uh, gender aware. You can teach people to be aware of class divisions and uh, and imperialism, even though that's that's a that's a form of aggression that's also happening on an unconscious level. But I'm not sure that you can teach someone Afro pessimism until they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. In other words, until until there's been. Uh, so I don't know how to do that as a group, even though I do try, I do try. I don't, I, I, have, I have no idea of what's getting through and what's not. I know that, that when I teach Marxism, I can see, aha, mm. value is not organic. Value is in socially necessary labor time. Right. Got it, all right. So value is a parasitic accumulation on the labor process. Wow, now I understand that. Now I can go to Macy's and see blood dripping from the racks as opposed to fine garments. Okay. But you know, this is a deeper kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that someone has to actually uh, be ready for it. You can, you can, you can read all that from us in books and, and learn that. But to inculcate it, I hate to say this, but I almost think something really tragic has to happen in your Black life for you to actually, or have happened, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Now, this is happening, that thing, and it is affecting, uh, you know, it was Trayvon Martin. And I really, I, I always have to shout out to the women and sexually non-conforming black people who do not get the kind of attention for their deaths that, that cisgender black men get. But the, cis, the death of cisgender black men created something in the libidinal economy of black people, which was like making them more ready for an Afro-pessimist lens of interpretation. And so whenever I go to a city, whether it's Montreal or London or Vienna, uh, Berlin, um, you know, I always find a group, a community center or, um, a chapter of Black Lives Matter or more amorphous, the movement for Black Lives. And we get together um, 10 to 35 people and do a workshop on, on Afro-pessimism because at that, you know, I was in Vienna in December, 2017, and um, I didn't even know there were Black people in Vienna, you know, <laughs> and, let alone the movement for Black Lives or, or organization, you know, and, and um, you know, a lot of these people are African immigrants. and 
they're just trying to like groove and get through school or whatever, you know? And so at a certain point, I think 15, 2015, 2016, they're also not necessarily ready to deal with this. But 2017, the cops rock up and kill a black person in cold blood, just like they do here. And now, okay, let's do an Afro-pessimist workshop. Everyone, it's, it's an emotional readiness uh, for it because otherwise people ask themselves the question, where does this get us? What do I do with this? What's on the other side? And Afro Pessimist says, on the other side is the end of the world. Not people not breathing, but on the other side is a dispensation which you cannot even imagine. There will be no blacks, there will be no humans. And I don't think, especially getting back to one of Hannibal's earlier questions, I don't think if you're in the groove of those years from like, late 20s to mid 60s that you're ready for that <laughs> I mean, you know, you've got ambitions you've got a job you've got this idea. i mean i would and i would interject you know and and you know i mean this might be some, a bit controversial in some circles but there is a segment of the population that's um readily available constantly uh, for that, for the prison, who who lived who lived their lives, you know, in and out of jail, yeah. um, who who you know their all of their um, like love relationships, familial relationships are in and out of jail, you know, um, on and off drugs, you know, and these kind of things, which. Um, you know, a lot of times in, in and this is, I think, where the class uh, question was coming in earlier, because there is a, um, there, I find in my experience that there's a fundamental difference in what the professional class or like, you know, like academics and, you know, uh, um, you know, people that are dealing with, with public policy, et cetera, you know, there's, there's, um, there's something there for them, you know, there's, there's potential, even if it's only imagined, there's a potential mobility, yeah. whereas, um, you know, there's others who um, have pretty much always been excluded, who, you know, there's, there's sort of like this, there's this tendency of, you know, well, like, you know, like gangs, thugs, et cetera, like the ghetto element, right? Or the lumping element or the dispossessed element where, you know, um, it's kind of like the, the thinking classes have, have long given up on their plight because it's like, it's, you know, the prison and all of its inhabitants along with the ghetto and all of its inhabitants is like too broad, too deep, too intangible, too, um, it's too much for it to be a, a, a project of change, right? And the best thing you can do is try to escape it. Yeah. You know what I mean? The best thing you can do is to try to escape the ghetto. But there are those people who, who never imagined themselves being able to escape. And so you might find them in, in um, in a whole, you know, broad range of ages, et cetera, yeah. um, which, you know, they're completely antagonistic to the system because there never was any suggestion that that they wouldn't be ghetto. Yeah. There was never any suggestion that that you know they might become articulate enough to to change their circumstances. And um, I mean, you know, like my my experience is is I tend to focus on that population because um, there is a it's an understanding like there's this inner subjectivity about the police, about prisons, about you know uh, um, you know you'd find academics and you'd find that public policy people are very interested in like current possibilities of, of policy change and current possibilities lines of thinking that are like new and exciting and and seductive etc whereas when you go to the ghetto there's this like flattened 
like it's the system we're in america america's designed to destroy us to keep us poor it, it's designed for us to be on drugs it's designed for us to be prostitutes it's designed for us to be gangbangers killing each other etc and it's generalized understanding you know um and i feel you know i, I my observation is kind of like you know there's this tendency on the part of academics to be like, man, that's like way too big and way too broad of an issue for us to even deal with. And so it, um, it's almost like, it's not like a, um, how can I put it? It's, it's, there's like, it's like nothing at stake because it's like those people are always gonna be ghetto. There's no possibility for movement in, with respect to that. So we're gonna focus on like potential avenues of, of self-expression, new types of gender that might be available, you know, new new types, new modes of thinking, et cetera. Um, but if you're in the ghetto, you're in the ghetto. You know what I'm saying? And it's, and it's kind of flat in that sense. Like, you, you know, it's like a, um, you know, it doesn't move. The ghetto is as it was, <laughs> you know what I mean? It is as it has been, you know, and, and whereas gentrification will, will move a population from, you know, say Oakland to Stockton, or, you know, or Antioch or Sacramento, et cetera, um, or from one part of Sacramento to another part of Sacramento County or, you know, things like that. The, when you're in the space of the ghetto, it's like, there's no imagined possibility of, you know, it's kind of just like, okay, like get accepted to college and get yourself out of there kind of thing, you know? Animal, did you have any other questions? I think there was, um, you know, honestly, I think we, we hit all of my questions. I'm looking now at the um, comments because <laughs> there's a lively, there's a lively, oh, there's a lively discussion threat, happening though. in the comments. So I'm trying to <laughs> keep up if there's any questions that come up, but. Um, Or this is I just to see this I just hit the chat thing here to see what you're seeing. I'm looking at oh. the Facebook. So with this live on Facebook. Yeah, the chat and, uh, is uh, between the moderators. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't see where you're seeing these, but I can go back Sorry. to Facebook page and see it, huh? Yeah, you can go to Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess. Um, let me just look, look, take one more quick look. Um, yeah, we kind of, I mean, we kind of hit all of them. Um, I guess I would ask you, you know, is, is there anything, um, you know, how do you feel watching the things that are going on right now? Like, you know, the fact that there's this like sweeping fire moving across America. <laughs> How does that make you feel? What are your thoughts on it? What are important things that people need to think about looking at this stuff? Yeah, it's too early for me to, to make some kind of prognosis. Um, when these things happen, uh, I, I try to give myself time, even though people are now calling me wanting me to write op-ed pieces and, and things like that. Um, but it's very painful. Uh, I have not watch more than the first uh, two seconds or so, three seconds or so of, of, the, of, the, of the video. I mean, I, I don't know if I can actually watch someone die all the way like that. Um, and uh, I, think, I think I can end by saying on, your, on the point that you're making, Hannibal, one of the things that the, the, the policy wonks uh, who are black are not understanding is that um, per capita, there are more of us in chattel today than there were in 1853. So you have a situation in which if you just look at the raw numbers, like 1.6 million men in prison and 
you know, uh, the black female population rises something like 800% a year. And those are, those are misleading numbers because what is really happening is that there are another like 4 million people under various forms of lockdown, whether it's ankle bracelets or halfway houses or go to prison five days a week and go home on the weekend or go to prison in the daytime, go home at night. Um, so in other words, uh, there could be 6 million black people formally in chattel at this, at this moment, which would mean that um, per capita, there's almost no such thing as a black nuclear family in America who does not have someone in some form of lockdown. That, that should stop the press. I mean, just that alone should just stop everything in its tracks and we should focus on, on that because that wasn't nearly the case of incarceration during slavery. It wasn't, it wasn't you, you couldn't say that, um, that, that there was, um, for every family, there was one person in some way enslaved. You just couldn't say that, you know, where you can say that today. And um, I, I think that you're absolutely right, Hannibal, that the narrative moves either towards escape. I mean, how do I get my, me and my kid away? Or towards some form of Band-Aid uh, scenario that ultimately means that uh, if there are tangible benefits, they will benefit people who are tangibly not in various forms of lockdown, not in the ghetto. And so my uh, hope, and it's, I'm not, I'm not, I have this hope, but I'm not very hopeful for the hope, is that the fire this time will not be harnessed for the Band-Aid solutions that benefit the black middle class. That the fire this time will be harnessed and given direction from the black people who are actually lighting the match. Um, that is my hope. I'm not hopeful that that can happen. I, I think that we have not begun to understand uh, what the COINTELPRO period did to uh, black life in general and uh, black organizing in particular. We have not begun to understand uh, William Maxwell's book, uh, FBI's, where we have, we're now in year 101 of the FBI's African-American literature department. It is the most sophisticated, well-resourced black studies literature department in the world, where they have been tracking uh, uh, black poetry, black creative nonfiction and black fiction since 1919 when Claude McKay wrote, If We Must Die. In other words, they are re they're, they're analyzing black, they're agents dedicated to reading black literature because what you can do when you read the artwork of a people is you can develop what's called a leading indicator as to the likely scenario of what they will be doing five, 10 years in the future. Okay, so that's, what it go, that's you think about that. You think about, oh, you go to Yale, study black literature. That's the most sophisticated place. Go to UC Irving. No, 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 no. The most sophisticated place to understand black literature is the FBI. They've been doing, they've had a black, black studies department since 1919, okay, where they've been, in, and they got to the point where now they have, they've been running what's called preventative detention lists for black writers. And they keep, adding and subtracting people off this list depending upon the year and what's happening so that these writers can be rounded up and put in what they call preventative detention camps should something like this go so haywire that the national guard can't can't um, deal with it and so if you think about the, if you think about the vertical integration of slavery from immaterial property like a literary studies department that is attended with concentration camps to on the street armed police and national guard to the thing that Hannibal brought up at the beginning, which is a judicial system, which is really just the brainchild of the slave system. When you think about that, um, it's like Sadia Hartman says, how can you appeal to that structure to redress your injury? And yet that's precisely what happens after every 
urban rebellion. Yeah, and you know, I mean, just to follow up on that, and I, you know, I'm kind of making this argument that um, that we're we're no longer in the era or in the age of of political parties, you know, mm -hmm. that we're in a we're in an era of of black insurgents who and their propaganda is fire. <laughs> and that I mean to say, you know, uh, uh, um, what I mean to say by that is that you, there's not going to be any legitimate spokesperson for a riot. There's no such thing as a legitimate spokesperson for a riot. The spokesperson is the fire. So when you see what they said on fire, that's what they had to say, yeah. you know, and what they decided to burn, it, it tells you the motives, it tells you you know the general direction etc right but we know of course that people are are going to pop up and prop up their careers yeah. by either you know like soft core denouncing it by saying this is only happening because you know the police didn't get arrested mm -hmm. or by making claims that they can't make as, as like that they're going to come in and, and negotiate on behalf of, of rioters to stop the rioting, you know, and that that if, if the state, you know, negotiates with us, if you meet our demands, you know, that that you know we can harness and and we can control these uprisings, you know, which I think is is a terrible analysis and and is borderline criminal, you know, but I think some people are naive enough to believe it, but I think a lot of people are actually they have malicious intentions towards the uprisings, you know, and I think they're gonna make use of it. To advance their careers because if you can offer yourself as a better black and offer yourself as like you know someone we can we can negotiate with some some type of elite uh you know protester or, or civil rights group that you know we can just talk to the five of you if i can just talk to one or two of you guys it's cool right but when you got this whole mass of blackness with with matches and you know rocks and things you know it, it, there's no negotiation it's an antagonism there's no one that you can go to and say hey you know get your forces to stand down because you know it was it, it's it's their experience it's their existence that that gathered them together it wasn't any organization that went around and knocked on doors and said hey y'all you know get your ski mask and get your matches ready we're gonna meet up on Friday. You know, that, that didn't happen. What happened was, you know, it there's spontaneous eruptions, right? And 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 then people come along after the fact. And by having a, a palatable message and by having a, a reconciliatory narrative, they their careers launched. Like, you know, what happened in Ferguson was um, there was a grassroots uprising, Black Lives Matter parachuted in. They become the spokespersons. They negotiate uh, multi-million dollar deals with the Department of Justice. They leave Ferguson and expand a narrative of Black Lives Matter. And then Black Lives Matter becomes the name applied. It's the moniker for anything that Black people do after that. And then the, the, the actual members of the organization, they set their sights on, po on policy. So they become you know, totally consumed with writing policy until the point where um, the media is like, you know, Black Lives Matter this, Black Lives Matter that, Black Lives Matter this, and and there's no longer any mobilizations, there's no longer any activity in the streets, and then Black Lives Matter themselves become kind of like, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, this sort of like uh, uh, um, just a voice of of uh, a voice on the internet almost if you will you know uh whereas before in a grassroots form like it was it was expanding you know it, it, it was popping off in ferguson it was popping off in florida it was popping off in california it popped off in baltimore and, and new york etc and then they gave it a name they gave it spokespeople those spokespeople did a, a multi-million dollar deal with the Department of Justice to quote unquote hold police accountable. Mm -hmm. And then the movement dwindled in, into almost nothing. Simultaneously, simultaneously, the grassroots agitators um, 
get eight year prison sentences, assassinated, yeah. straight up killed, and and um, Black Lives Matter never took up the defense of any of them. And in no. Ferguson, there were so many uh, extrajudicial killings of the actual militants who were involved in the protests and the riots and the uprisings, yeah. uh, while simultaneously a more like a civil rights group with a brand name had emerged. Uh, so those of us who were in various locations and embedded in the struggle, we saw that in front of our eyes, you know, emerging. And, you know, and to me, the saddest part about it, really the saddest part about it is that they know they're dealing with something that's not structured and organized. Mm -hmm. And they appoint themselves as spokespeople of something that's not structured and organized. And thus, there's no nothing to hold them accountable to. Yeah. There's no movement that they need to work for. Like one thing that I learned from you, Uncle Frank, was that, you know, when you were in South Africa, there was a, a vibrant, organized, structured movement that you had to be accountable to. You, as an individual public intellectual, you couldn't just go out and say whatever you felt like saying and push the movement in any direction you felt like pushing it without expecting some serious consequences from the movement which you're accountable to. But when we're dealing with a generalized insurgency, and not an organized, structured political party, not you know a, a structured platform of, of politics, et cetera. Um, it's kind of like you know people can kind of have their way with it, you know, which I found to be really depressing at yeah. times. And um, you know, it's only now really that I feel people are coming out of that depression because they see a police station set on fire. Mm -hmm. That was important. That was very important. Yeah. I'm turning into a pumpkin now, guys. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Frank. I mean, we we actually uh, covered more than we thought we could cover. And, yeah, we went pretty far. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for, <laughs> for tolerating us. I know I'm like, you know, kind of making some trouble. No, I, well, it, it was it was just me wondering uh, how I'm going to say something and say nothing <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> 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 you know? But your last point, Hannibal, is very, very well taken, and, and yeah. All right, you guys, and, and the sister who, I forgot her name, who was helping Isra. us. Isra Ibrahim. Yes, Isra yes. Ibrahim. Isra? Isra. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. She is helping us with the technology and everything. Thank you, Isra, for everything. I hope to meet you today. Thank you for being here. I really enjoyed your commentary. I, I, you guys brought a lot out of me. Thank you. <laughs> I learned we'll, a lot. We'll, we'll see if you again. Get, <laughs> if you get in any trouble, man, we got your back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most definitely. Thank you so much. Thanks to all our viewers. Thank you, Frank, for joining us and explaining to us again that we have to point our finger at the real antagonisms of history and to understand our reality, the world, and how it's working and the structure of the world as such. So thank you again. And um, I would like to just remind our uh, uh, viewers that we, we're doing, we, 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 you, can, you can follow that there's a pattern here. We had War Churchill come to us before, we who talked about the condition of, of settler colonialism. And we talked about the essay that he wrote about 9-11. Uh, that was really significant for our listeners and our viewers. So we're going through all of these important scholars and thinkers who are making us think about the world as such in, in mul from multiple angles to understand the question of antagonism, to understand the question of war and what happens and what our responsibilities are as those of us who are embedded in various forms of struggle. Um, in today's conversation, it was really significant in relation to what happened to Minneapolis. I'm located in Minnesota right now, I was there when the police station was on fire. And uh, it is very important to observe and to see what's happening and to actually, today's conversation is very relevant to what we're seeing in various cities throughout the United States and to understand and assess those situations in each case, you know, differently probably because the, the equations are different in per, per city. So I really encourage our followers to look into Frank Wilderson's work. He has three really significant books. Um, it influenced a lot of our thinking 
And uh, even for those of us who come from a different framework, we have tried to engage really deeply with some of the, the, the analysis of Afro-pessimism. So we really want to thank you, Frank, for all of your work. And we really appreciate all of that and for joining us. And hopefully we'll see each other in person soon as well. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.